Evening, everyone. Oh, there we go. Mic check. One, two, three. Uh, thank you so much for being with us tonight. We're delighted to have a fascinating conversation on that minor issue we're all thinking about, the Supreme Court of the United <laughs> States. Um, I am Katie Culver. I'm director of the Center for Journalism Ethics here at UW-Madison UW in our School of Journalism and Mass Communication. Uh, our many students who are here from the J School. I'm also the James E. Burgess Chair in Journalism Ethics and... Um, this is the James E. Burgess Chair. <laughs> I'm sitting in. Well, chairs, we can have two. <laughs> I'd love another James E. Burgess Chair. Uh, so I am delighted tonight uh, to welcome uh, one of my favorite um, thinkers and reporters on justice in the United States, and that's Pete Williams, recently retired from NBC News. Uh, so Pete, as I think you all know, covered the U.S. Supreme Court and the Departments of Justice and Homeland Security, right? Yep. Um, he uh, has covered many of our nation's most important stories, including the Oklahoma City, Olympic Park, and Boston Marathon bombings, um, as well as the federal government's massive restructuring and investigations following uh, the 9-11 terror hijackings. He's a recipient of four National News Emmy Awards, as as well as two Edward R. Murrow Awards and the John F. Hogan Award from the Radio, Television, Digital News Association. Uh, he is also the recipient of a wicked bad cold <laughs> that he caught during his time here uh, in Madison, but is, uh, is just, is given it, given it his co good old college try for us tonight, and we're so grateful for that. Also grateful that it's not anything worse than a cold. So I've been tested. <laughs> Shoo, on that. Um, so without further ado, let me get going with some of my questions. And then um, after that, we're going to open it up to, uh, to audience questions. So uh, please get your minds churning as we're talking. <laughs> Our wonderful fellows uh, from the Center for Journalism Ethics will be walking around with the mics. Also, welcome to all of you who are joining us online. We're really grateful that you are here with us. If you uh, would like to pose a question, please go ahead and put that in the chat and our fellows will ask it for you here uh, live in the play circle at the beautiful Memorial Union on the UW-Madison campus. Pete's very impressed by our campus, so <clears throat> perhaps you could come and do a longer residency sometime. Uh, he was pretty blown away that we have the only student union in the country that sells beer. So, <laughs> uh, so let me start at the beginning. Uh, what led you to a career in journalism? Well, thank you, Katie, and let me first of all apologize for my voice. Uh, this is sort of like being a, entering a golf tournament with a broken leg. Uh, you can do it, but it's not a pretty sight. So I apologize if I sound like Rod Stewart. Um, well, you know, it's funny. I, I am puzzled by people who say they don't, wanna, they don't know what they're going to do when they grow up because I've always known I wanted to do this. When I was... Um, uh, 11 years, no, when I was nine years old, I had a neighborhood newspaper. <laughs> I sold it for three cents. It was full of riveting things about who was growing what in their gardens and what sort of pets were new in the neighborhood. Probably the, the most accurate part is what I called it, the needless news. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, um, I, was, uh, I worked at a, uh, a radio station when I was in high school. I worked at the campus radio station when I went to college at Stanford. Uh, as soon as I got out of Stanford, I came back to my hometown of Casper, Wyoming, and was a reporter and news director of the statewide TV and radio operation. And um, I, I, you know, I just have always known this is what I wanted to do. What led you into covering the law? Um, I've always been fascinated by the law. Um, I don't, you know, my, this is not something that many people know. I've been known as Pete since I was, uh, before I can remember, in the mists of prehistory. My legal name is Lewis Allen Williams. Now think about those initials. <laughs> um, so maybe it, was, maybe it was predestination, I don't know, but... Um, I started covering the law when I was still in Wyoming, and I always found it fascinating. Um, I said in one of the classes that I was talking about here, maybe it's just because I'm somebody who likes rules. I don't know. <laughs> but I think the law is fascinating. Um, when I came to NBC, I had worked at the Department of Defense, so I clearly as, was not going to cover defense issues. It would have been in inappropriate for many reasons. Um, and Carl Stern, who is known here, uh, remembered. Uh, Carl, who was an anchorman for many years in Cleveland, 
before he went to NBC, was my predecessor on the Justice Beat. And as I was coming in, he was going out the door to become the spokesman for the Justice Department. Um, so there was an opening, and Tim Russert, who was the bureau chief of NBC News um, and in the Washington Bureau and also the host of Meet the Press, uh, said, do you want to cover the Supreme Court? And I said, yeah, I'd love to. And I think the reason nobody else wanted it at the time was it was considered uh, too much homework per minute on the air. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, you do have to read the briefs. You do have to listen to the oral argument. I love it, though. I, I think it's fascinating. I love the law, and, and, and it's just, it was lucky that I got that beat. So uh, you did make that little pit stop there. You had uh, some time um, <laughs> working in the political sphere uh, for Dick Cheney. And then well, I would actually disagree with you about the political sphere. Okay. I was, in fact, a political appointee because at the time my uh, position at the Defense Department was a political appointment, so I was an assistant secretary of defense, had to be confirmed by the Senate. But I didn't do much politics. Um, you know, the... There was an agreement then, and I think there still is, that the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense don't go out and campaign for the president. Uh, they don't do much politics. Now, of course, we have civilian control of the military, and ultimately it's the political leadership, small p, who are in charge of defense policy. But my job as the, as the Pentagon spokesman was really, what's the right word, sort of a corporate spokesman for the department which consisted, of course, of the political leadership, but also the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and sometimes the Coast Guard. So I was really more of an institutional spokesman than a political figure. Uh, however, I take your point that I was working for the government. <laughs> and what were the ethics challenges of that when you went from that spokesman role in, into journalism? How did you handle that? I will summarize the ethics challenges as saying there were none, as far as I'm concerned because my job when I worked at the Department of Defense was to be loyal to the government and to, uh, and to follow the, the dictates of my bosses. When I went to NBC News, my job was to be loyal to the National Broadcasting Company. And I, I didn't find that a difficult transition to make. I mean, I had worked as a reporter for what, 11 or 12 years before I got into the government. And I, I briefly worked in both the Senate and the House as a staffer, too, before I went to DOD. <clears throat> but I didn't, you know, I, I was hardly a trailblazer. Uh, Diane Sawyer, many of you know, uh, at CBS and ABC, worked for Richard Nixon. Uh, my boss, Tim Russert, had worked for Pat Moynihan in the Senate and for Mario Cuomo when he was governor of New York. So, you know, I don't, I, think, I don't think it's an impossible transition to make. I think it would be difficult for me to go through that door twice. Uh, and as a matter of fact, again, this is not something that I've talked about much publicly, but uh, early in the second Bush administration, when my old boss, Dick Cheney, became vice president, um, Mary Madeline, who had been a spokesman for him and for the president, decided to move on in life and called me and said, you should go work for your old boss again. And I said, you know, I just can't. I just, you know, there are lawyers in Washington who work in a private law firm and then go into the government and work at the National Security Agency or something and then go back to private practice and back and forth. And in fact, I think that's actually a good thing for the country that we have sort of old hands around that know how to run the, you know, know where all the valves are in the government in the government, but, uh, and they can come and go. And it, in fact, I think just burnishes their resume. I couldn't have done that twice. So staying on the, uh, the ethics issue, what are some of your biggest ethical challenges or things that you faced in covering? Let, let's focus squarely on the court. You can throw a little DOJ in if you'd like to, but sprinkle that in, sprinkle a little justice in, but specifically covering the court, when it comes to journalistic ethics, what kinds of barriers did you face? Well, I think the obligation for somebody who covers the Supreme Court or any court is to be neutral and that nobody should be able to watch your story on nightly news or read it on the web and say, aha, 
He wants that side to win. Um, it's not hard to maintain that neutrality because the court is built to have two sides. You know, if you and I get into a legal tussle and you win in the lower court, I'm the one that appeals to the Supreme Court, and so it's you versus me. So there are two sides to every, there are automatically two sides to every, you don't have to go searching for the other point of view. It's right there. And I had the experience of, you know, the reason cases come to the Supreme Court, for the most part, and perhaps this was more true <laughs> in the last decade than it is now, but the reason cases come to the Supreme Court is because they're hard and they're difficult. And um, so I find the experience, I would read the petitioner's brief, the person asking the court to take the case, as you all know, because you're University of Wisconsin whiz bang students, um, <clears throat> unlike the Wisconsin State Supreme Court, there is no right of appeal to the US Supreme Court. It doesn't have to take your case. So it's a two-step process. First you file a petition asking, will the court please take my case? It's called a petition of certiorari, or as the lawyers call it, a cert petition. And if the court says, yes, we'll take your case, then there's a new round of briefing on why you should win and the other side is a bum and should lose. And I would find the experience of reading those briefs, I'd read the petitioner's brief and I'd think, oh, that makes a lot of sense. That should... And then I'd read the respondent's brief and I'd say, oh, actually that's a pretty good argument too. So um, my job in presenting that story for Nightly News or the Today Program or whatever, was to make sure that I gave equal weight to both sides and didn't indicate whether I had a point of view about who should win. And, you know, in many of these cases, I didn't um, have a, a point of view about who should win. I thought they were interesting legal questions. And so it wasn't hard to, I think, be neutral. Now, obviously, uh, you'd be a pretty cold fish if you didn't have some views occasionally about the big issues of who should win or lose. <clears throat> but again, my job was not to, not to tilt it one way or the other or, or suggest that one side had the better argument. So for me, one of the biggest concerns, I'm so glad you just did the whole education of the audience on granting <laughs> cert because that leads directly, we didn't practice this in advance. It's the perfect segue into my next question, which is one of my biggest journalism ethics concerns with coverage of the court is that it's so driven in some outlets almost entirely driven uh, by decisions. Should we be doing more to cover what cases get cert? Um, should we be doing more coverage of oral arguments? Should we be covering not just cases, but the court itself as an institution more than we do now? So decisions will always lowercase t, trump any other story, <laughs> because that's the final word. The, you know, of all the steps in a case coming to the Supreme Court, the decision is the big, the big one. So, a dis, you know, on any given day, if you have your choice between six things and one of them is a decision, well, that's pretty easy. The decision will win the day. <coughs> but um, on a big story like the abortion case, uh, we'll do it. We'll we'll take several bites at that apple. We'll do a story when the court grants the case, says it's going to take the case. That's a big step. Uh, we'll do a story when the briefs are submitted. Um, I did a story because the, the state of Mississippi, the, um, we're talking about the abortion case now, uh, it's a very curious one because, first of all, the Supreme Court does not view its mission as the judicial injustice corrector. It views its mission as harmonizing the law. That's the number one reason the Supreme Court takes a case. Because if the Ninth Circuit says, um, this is how you administer the tax law out in California, and the Fourth Circuit in Virginia says, no, 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 you do it this way, then that's, boy, that's going to head to the Supreme Court for them to say, no, this is how it works nationwide. So harmonizing the law is the number one reason the court takes a case. Well, 
there were no circuit splits in the Mississippi case because all the lower courts had said, what are you nuts? You can't ban abortion after 15 weeks. The Supreme Court has said it's unconstitutional to ban abortion before the age of viability, which is 24 weeks. So there was no circuit split. So the very fact that the court took the case was a big, big deal. And it meant, you know, uh-oh, if you're a supporter of abortion rights, trouble. Mississippi, when it originally asked the court to take the case, said, don't worry, you don't have to overturn Roe v. Wade. You can decide this case without overturning Roe. Now, you might ask yourself, how would, how would they have done that? And in fact, that is the middle ground that the Chief Justice, John Roberts, had proposed during argument. I'm sorry, I'm giving you a very long answer. I like this answer. What, do we finish tomorrow <laughs> afternoon at 3? Uh, we could finish um, next summer. Right? Okay, I'm, like I'll, I'll try to move along here. But uh, the answer is, you would say, well, under our precedence, a state cannot ban an abortion or enact a law that is an undue burden on the abortion right. Well, in fact, in Mississippi, no clinic would perform an abortion after 16 weeks anyway. So the argument would go, banning it after 15 weeks is not an undue burden. That would have been the argument. Anyway, Mississippi said, when they, when they asked the court to take the case at the cert stage, they said, please take the case. And don't worry, walk in the park. You don't have to overturn Roe. Then after the court granted the case, Mississippi said, okay, now it's time to overturn Roe. <laughs> So there was a little bait and switch there and that the filing of that brief was a big story. And then the argument was a big story. Uh, so, you know, on a big case, we, uh, we will do several, several stories. And, and, and I don't mean us, I mean people who cover the court. And I'd say one other thing. When the court denies a case, when it says no, that's often a story too. Because, you know, you've, you've seen a big fight brewing over whether the Supreme Court's going to take it. Well, look at the stories that have been done about the court wouldn't uh, revisit the, all these questions that Donald Trump has brought before the court in recent months, and they've said no. And so that denials uh, have been a story too. So let's dig into, you know, we've got a lot to say about Dobbs, I'm sure, but let's get into the concept of the politicization of the court. Um, and I, I want to start with one thing that I notice in a lot of news coverage, not just at the Supreme Court, but right down to the circuit level, is journalists including which president appointed a judge. <laughs> Should that be in stories? You know, the judges all hate that um, because they want to be regarded as, you know, not just errand boys and girls for whoever appointed them. Is there such an expression as errand girl? I don't know. <laughs> anyway... Uh, toadies, maybe is a better <laughs> word. They don't want to be viewed that way. So they hate it. At the, every level, they hate if we say... But I, I, look, I think it's sometimes... When I include it is when it's a surprise. So, for example, if the D.C. Court of Appeals rules against Donald Trump, and, the, and I should explain one other thing about how the federal courts work. So if we're suing each other and we go to the trial court, which in the federal system is known as the district court. There's a single judge. And then, because you have the much better case, you win. And if I'm going to appeal, my appeal goes to a three-judge panel of the Court of Appeals, not the whole court. It goes to a three-judge panel first. Now, if I lose before the three-judge panel, I can ask the whole court to hear it, which, of course, lawyers use. They can't speak without Latin, it's called en banc, and that's the whole Megillah, the whole court to hear it. And I have the right to do that, and then after that I have to ask the Supreme Court to take the case. But, you know, if, if there's a Trump case, let's say, before the D.C. Court of Appeals, a three-judge panel, and he loses, and two of the three judges were Trump appointees, that seems to me newsworthy and relevant. So I think there are times when you do it when it's a surprise. Um, I wouldn't do it all the time. It's kind of boring. You know, a judge in, in Tennessee, a Carter appointee, or a, a, <laughs> if there are any left, or a, a, you know, an Obama appointee, big deal. But when it's relevant, sure, I think you I include it, yes. As in with the 11th Circuit and the special master decision. Sure. Yes, that would be a yeah, nice one. Yeah, exactly. I think uh, with teaching, 
in my law class, I'm going to stop saying unbank and I'm going to say the whole McGill. <laughs> <laughs> I, think that's, I think that's a good change. For the, <laughs> student, the students should love it. Uh, so we're at a point with this court where schol many legal scholars would argue that the court is functioning in a political way. The court is, um, you know, one uh, one person I follow uh, says, you know, radical to the point of reckless. Um, in covering the court, if your goal, as you said before, is neutrality, do you relay that to your audience? Well, you're retired now, so you can be, you can get on Katie's rocket ship. So I don't have an audience. Planet. This is yes. my audience. Yeah. Should, Let's all go out together when this is over. How, um, should, how should journalists be covering the court as an institution right now? Well, first of all, you know, it's not just legal scholars, it's lots of folks who say the court is political. And um, I think it's, in, it's worth noting that the people on the court now who tend to vote in conservative ways were all appointed by Republican presidents. The people who tend to vote in liberal ways were all appointed by Democratic presidents. Now, that did not used to be the case. Uh, there was an 11-year period, remember, where there was no change in the Supreme Court from the moment that um, uh, the, uh, 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 Stephen Breyer came onto the court in 1974 until William Rehnquist died of pancreatic cancer in 1985. We, we went through 11 years with no change on the court. And we had the swing votes then, the vote that could decide the case was Sandra Day O'Connor, who was appointed by Ronald Reagan, Anthony Kennedy, who was also appointed by Ronald Reagan. We had John Paul Stevens, who was the court's only Ford appointee, who was often voting with the liberals. So it wasn't true that the, the, the people who tended to vote conservatively were all appointed by Republican presidents. Now it is true. And so I think that's one reason why those clever legal scholars have figured this out. Uh, but the other thing is, um, if you ask um, Stephen Breyer, who just retired, um, refresh my memory on who reported that Breyer was going to retire. Was that you? Oh, yes, it was. Um, so <laughs> oh, you shameless thing. Um, uh, if you ask Stephen Breyer, um, and let me tell you, I'm, I'm too much, sorry. I'm, this is great. I'm loving I'm going to tell you just a little quick story about how Washington works. So I'm a Stanford graduate. So the Stanford Magazine called me up and said, you know, when Breyer retires, it's going to be the end of a long run of Stanford presence on the Supreme Court because it started with Rehnquist and O'Connor and Kennedy and Breyer. And could you get an interview with Breyer for the Stanford Magazine? And I thought, that'll be easy. So in, I don't know, March, I guess, I called his chambers and said, you know, would he do this? And his secretary said, oh, yeah, I'm sure he would. Called me back and said, Justice Breyer says he's very busy. Please see an interview he did with Harvard Magazine 10 years ago. <laughs> I thought, okay, thanks a lot. <laughs> then, Breyer announced he was going to retire. And shortly thereafterwards, there was a joint session of Congress and Biden spoke. It's sort of a State of the Union kind of thing. And you may, if you saw it, you remember at the very beginning, Biden calls out Breyer, you know, commends him for his service to the court. Everybody stands up. There's applause, and Breyer is sort of overcome with emotion. So he calls his the public information officer, a woman named Patricia McCabe, and says, that was a great moment. I want that picture for my grandchildren. Can you get me the still picture of that moment? So she called me. We, we found every still photographer who was in the House chamber that day, AP, uh, Reuters, AFP, the European Press Agency, nobody shot that still. Hmm. I mean, there were close-ups of Breyer when it was happening, but none had the picture that he had in his mind. So I found the video and made a, a freeze frame, and we had that printed up for Breyer. And he was terribly grateful. Okay. Then my next door neighbor at NBC, the, who shares the office right next to me, is Andrea Mitchell. She's married to Alan Greenspan. Alan Greenspan is a pal of Stephen Breyer's. So Andrea comes into my office and says, 
Alan's been invited <laughs> to Justice Breyer's chambers for lunch. Do you think I should go? <laughs> I said, yes, and here's what you have to do. Remind him who gave him that picture and tell him he has to do the interview with me. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> so that's how Washington works. <laughs> so now back to your question. You're wondering, you know, well, are we ever going to get back? And the answer is yes. Uh, if you ask Breyer, as I did, isn't the court now just terribly political, his answer was no. <clears throat> that it's true that Brett Kavanaugh, Neil Gorsuch, Alito, they tend to vote in a conservative way, but that's not a Republican conservative outlook. That just happens to be their jurisprudence. And their jurisprudence existed before they were nominated, and that's why they were nominated. I think he's a committee of one who believes that that is the answer to the question. <clears throat> I, think, I think this is a more conservative court. I, I hesitate to say it's partisan. I don't think it's a Republican-dominated court, but it's a conservative court. And the one thing I think you can say about this court is that the conservatives are in a hurry. They've been in the minority for so long that they have been, you know, champing at the bit to finally do a lot of things. And so they are making up for lost time and they are in a hurry. That is so true in the abortion decision. I mean, the fact that they took the case, it's astonishing. The fact, and the, you know, you could, there, there was, the ruling was no surprise because they took the case, that told you almost everything you needed to know. They upheld that goofy Texas law that allows anybody in the world to sue anybody in Texas who assists in an abortion. That should be the second clue. And then the statements they made during oral argument were the, was the third clue. So, uh, you know, when the abortion decision came out <laughs> twice, <laughs> I don't think it was a surprise. A shock, maybe, but not a surprise. That, that, that's an interesting way of putting it. Uh, I, I want to turn to a little bit of rep recent reporting on the court coming out of the New York Times and, and others. We mentioned Dahlia Lithwick, by the way, if you'd like to become an educated court watcher, she's one to follow. Mm -hmm. um, that the leak in Dobbs is not necessarily the, uh, a, a first-time thing, that there may have been a leak in the Hobby Lobby case, um, not the full decision, not the draft <coughs> opinion, uh, but who was the author, Justice Alito, uh, and that the ruling was going to go in Hobby Lobby's favor. Say a little bit about the Hobby Lobby case and uh, the implications of that leak. A lot of people are focused on was Alito the leak in that situation and then does that make Alito the leak in Dobbs? I tend to think that's not the whole Nagila here. No, I, <laughs> That's I, not I, the big I, kahuna. Let's talk about what is. Yeah, uh, first of all, it was so, certainly not the first leak of a decision. Uh, the first leak of a decision that I know of was Roe v. Wade itself in mm -hmm. 1973. Uh, there was a clerk at the Supreme Court, we know this now because the clerk fessed up to it almost immediately, who leaked it to a Time Magazine reporter named David Beckwith, who coincidentally became uh, uh, the uh, vice president under the first Bush. Um, Quayle. Dan Quayle. Beca thank you. He became Dan Quayle's press secretary. He's easy to but forget. But at the time, he was working for Time magazine. And uh, a clerk leaked him the decision, uh, thinking that it would help the reporting and make it, you know, if he'd had time to look at it in advance. So it actually came out on the newsstand before the court announced it. Uh, this upset the chief justice at the time, a Warren Berger, um, and when the clerk admitted it, Berger said, oh, okay, and you can stay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the, what the New York Times story said is that um, a former anti-abortion crusader named Rob Schenck had come up with this idea on kind of lobbying justices by having people give money to the Supreme Court Historical Society, which puts on uh, lectures about the, about historic Supreme Court decisions and justices and so forth. And uh, they did this as a way of meeting the justices and kind of schmoozing with them. And according to the New York Times, something, by the way, that Justice Alito has publicly denied, according to the Times, uh, a couple that was giving money to the Historical Society was invited to dinner 
by Justice Alito and his wife. And during the dinner, the justice said, I think you're going to like the Hobby Lobby decision because I wrote it and it comes out in your favor. Now, Hobby Lobby was a, a religious religiously held private corporation that has these craft stores. Um, and they were opposing a provision in the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, that said employers had to provide coverage for contraceptives. And the Supreme Court ruled in Hobby Lobby's favor and said, if you're a closely held, family held, closely held uh, corporation uh, based on religious principles, then you are exempt from that. A particular thing. I think what Dahlia said, and I tend to agree, first of all, you know, maybe Justice Alito told them what the decision was going to be, and maybe he didn't. If I had to put money on it, I would bet that he didn't, just because that it would be a, such a shocking thing to do. And secondly, I can't tell you the number of times I would sit at my desk and someone would call me and say, hey, I know the uh, Supreme Court's going to announce the decision in my case next week. And it was never right. They never knew. Uh, so, you know, people always thought they knew uh, stuff about the Supreme Court that wasn't true. I think what the Dahlia's point is, is, and I think it's probably right, is that the, the, the most troubling thing about that is not so much that a justice was telling someone what the opinion was going to be, but that a justice put himself in the position of being, in essence, lobbied or hanging out with people of a, a like view. Now, I think it's, it's true. I don't think that Samuel Lito's vote was in any way swayed by having lunch with this couple or dinner. I think he, he ate with them because they were like-minded. And uh, so I think, you know, if it's a chicken and egg thing, I, I think his point of view is what attracted them to him. He, they didn't change his point of view. Um, but query, uh, you know, if the, if, if, the, if the goal is to avoid the appearance of impropriety, was that such a, a smart thing to do? And, you know, my own view is like Dahlia's, I don't think so. Well, so we're in the business of journalism ethics here, but I'd like to deal with judicial ethics related to this. Uh, it wasn't just Alito, um, it was Justice Thomas and his wife, others. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on the state of ethics on the court right now? You know, Roberts is an institutionalist. Uh, I think he would like to have some of those <laughs> associate justices recuse themselves when, say, their spouse is somehow caught up in a case. Uh, but there are not rules <laughs> or enforceable rules. Um, you know, what are we to do about that? Is it appropriate, is it ethically appropriate for a Supreme Court justice to attend Federalist Society events, to speak, to take speaker fees? Um, you know, what about um, a Ruth Bader Ginsburg who had a very close personal relationship with a journalist who covered the court? Actually, that's judicial ethics and journalism ethics together. Uh, what's the state of play in ethics on that court? Well, of course, there is a federal law uh, that says that, that, that governs, uh, that sets ethical rules for lower court judges. Now, what they say at the Supreme Court is, we can't apply those rules here for the simple for this, for this reason. When our case reaches a three-judge panel um, before the D.C. Circuit, and you know one of the judges uh, is your nephew, uh, then I'm going to ask that judge to recuse, to take himself off the case. And that's no problem. They get another judge. They don't have any spare judges at the Supreme Court. There's just the nine of them. So if someone recuses, they're down to eight. And another recuses, they're down to seven. And that changes the, the math, and, and, you know, it's not ideal. Now, Supreme Court judges, or justices, do recuse from time to time. They, they don't have to say why, but they do recuse. And it's usually because either they've, they've got a relative that's involved in a company or something, or they own stock in a holding company that's involved in the case or something. So we get, I don't know, a dozen or so recusals a year. Um, but that's why the court says we can't use those same ethical rules that apply to lower courts. I, I think, I don't know it, it, whether they, the tempest over the Alito thing and the concern about Ginny Thomas's uh, very public lobbying on President Trump's behalf um, has 
cause any kind of rethinking at the court about whether that sort of thing is appropriate, you'd certainly hope so. I think you're right about your assessment of how the chief feels about it. Yeah, but, but pretty powerless to do, <laughs> do anything in response. So uh, I couldn't agree with you more that there are uh, justices to, who seem to be in a hurry, and they're in a hurry on a few different things. Um, religious liberty, very high on that list for yes. sure. Yes. This is a mighty consequential term for the court. Uh, you know, all eyes were on uh, Dobbs and the gun decision and the climate decision um, at the end of the last term. This term is a doozy. So let's talk about a couple of those, okay. <laughs> a couple of those cases. So I want to start out with um, 303 Creative. So for those of you who don't know, this is a case um, that, was that is, is before the court right now, just recently in oral arguments. It involves a website designer um, in Colorado who uh, did not design wedding websites, uh, but says that Colorado's public accommodation law, when she wanted to get into the wedding website business, would force her uh, to uh, serve LGBTQ couples. Actually, she, she, she wanted to put a, a, a thing on the front of her website that said, uh, by the way, don't ask me to do same-sex weddings because that would violate my religious point of view. Right, and Colorado said that's a violation of their public accommodation laws. Right. So it's under oral argument now. Uh, I'll confess, um, I'm, I'm critical of some news coverage sometimes, and uh, this week was a humdinger for me. I really felt that in the main, the coverage emphasized the collegiality between the justices. Um, in, in those oral arguments, they weren't really getting to the nut here. What did you think of it? Um, well, it's a difficult case simply because the Supreme Court has twice before taken a pass on this issue. The question is, can a business owner refuse to serve a same-sex wedding um, either because of religious views or uh, first, uh, free speech views? You know, two parts of the First Amendment. The fir it first came before the court in a Another case from Colorado, a baker from a company called Masterpiece Cake Shop who was asked by two men to bake a case celebrating their wedding, and he said, no, I won't do it. It came to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled in his favor, but it was a ticket good for one ride only because what they basically said is Jack Phillips, the baker, got a raw deal from the Colorado Human Rights Commission because they sort of gave short shrift to his religious views. But they didn't answer the question. And then they came back in another case called Arlene's Flowers from the Pacific Northwest, uh, um, a woman who refused to provide flowers for a same-sex wedding. Uh, the Supreme Court delphically sent it back to the lower courts saying, well, apply our <laughs> ruling in Masterpiece Cake and decide this case. And the lower court went, what ruling? Um, <laughs> And so she lost again. It came back to the Supreme Court again, and they declined to take it. <clears throat> so they did take the 303 case. It was argued not as a freedom of religion case, but as a freedom of speech case. And, the, and I think that's because the group that's behind these lawsuits called Alliance Defending Freedom um, thought that the religion argument would be a loser even though this court, as, as you say, especially solicitous of religious uh, claims of religious discrimination. <clears throat> so the question is, you know, is a website design speech? Um, you know, probably is. Uh, I don't know that there was a clear answer to the case. I mean, the coverage that I've seen all said that it looks like she's going to win, but I'm not sure exactly that it was clear from the argument what the, what the legal reason will be. And perhaps that's one of the reasons why the coverage all tended to focus on the analogies, you know, the, all the cultural references there were. It was just hypothetical upon hypothetical, yeah, right? Yeah. With some bizarre uh, mall Santa KKK robes. Yeah, that was Katanji Brown. In there. That was yeah. Katanji Brown the, Jackson's and, uh, question. And, yeah. a, and a really strange interaction with Justice Gorsuch who seemed to assert that uh, civil rights training in Colorado or, or public accommodation training was re-education. <laughs> that, that one stopped me 
stop me in my tracks listening to it. Well, it's his um, home state. Maybe that's why he came. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it is interesting that this is the 303 is a First Amendment case because you know as the court has had its its split, its conservative um, liberal split. The First Amendment cases are the cases where you find often some mighty strange bedfellows and a lot of consensus. Yeah, I mean, uh, look at one of the most surprising uh, First Amendment decisions I think of recent years was uh, the Supreme Court striking down the Stolen Valor Act, which made it a federal crime to claim you had a military honor when in fact you didn't. This was a guy who was on a city council in California and he claimed in his election ads that he had a legion of merit, not a legion of merit, but I remember what, what military decoration he claimed to have had. He didn't. And so the Supreme Court said, well, you know, he had a free speech. That's a free speech right. The, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of uh, uh, the uh, group, the self-styled church from Kansas that Westboro. goes around. West, Westboro Baptist Yeah, Westboro church. Baptist Church that runs around to funerals. Uh, criticize, you know, saying God hates fags and that kind of thing. And the Supreme Court ruled, yeah, I'm sorry, that's a First Amendment right, they have to do that. So they've been very, they've been very um, solicitous, protective of First Amendment rights. Um, and we saw this a little bit last term in the praying coach from uh, Bremerton, Washington, who insisted on going out to the 50-yard line after games and dropping to one knee and saying a prayer. And... Uh, he was, you know, uh, it didn't, they, he just made such a spectacle about it that the school didn't renew his contract and the Supreme Court said, you know, you violated his religious rights. You know, the sole dissenter in the Westboro Baptist case was Alito. It's an interesting dissent. Worth, mm -hmm. a, worth a read, all of you, in your spare time. Uh, so now I want to talk about one that is really bothering me right now when we're talking about the, the journalism uh, coverage of the court and this, uh, this term's docket. And that's Moore versus Harper, which uh, I tend to call the most consequen consequential case none of you know anything about uh, right now. So um, it's again- Are you including me in that? No, oh, I'm okay. not, which is why I'm asking you for your expertise <laughs> and enlighten all of us on you know, the very tight basics of this case, the independent state legislature theory. I use the term very loosely. This is not a theory that any of you would ever encounter in a, in a course on theory. Uh, what does it mean for us? What does that, what could this case mean for us? Yeah, and probably why is it not getting more coverage? Well, probably not much based on the argument today. Uh, it was, the case was argued today, but here's the, here's the notion. Uh, this is, it, this involves a, uh, uh, a redistricting for congressional uh, districts. Um, the state drew the boundaries. Uh, the, they were sued. The state was sued. Uh, the parties said, you know, you didn't you, you need to create more boundaries, more congressional districts in which minority voters have a chance to elect candidates of their choice. Um, and the Republicans in the legislature sued, saying, uh, and the Supreme Court, you know, they sued and the state Supreme Court ruled in their favor. It ruled in the favor of the challengers. Uh, and the state Republicans went to the Supreme Court and said, wait a minute, the Constitution says that when it comes to the election of members of Congress, Republican or representatives and senators, the times, place, and manners of elections shall be set by the legislature of the states. So that means, this Republican said, we get to do things like drawing congressional district boundaries and the state courts have no role in this. Um, and the extension of that argument is beyond just redistricting that if there's any dispute over an election, the legislature gets the last word and the state courts have no role here. <clears throat> now, what, this, what, what, the, uh, what the state said is, well, that's not entirely right. State courts still get to decide whether things are constitutional or not under the state constitution. So the legislature doesn't have a free pass to enact a provision or set a rule that would violate the state constitution. And we're the ones who blow the whistle on that. So the independent state legislature theory, if it, if it were to prevail, uh, let's get in the way back machine and go back to the uh, last presidential, or not the last presidential election, but the one before, 
No, let's go back to the last presidential election. <laughs> that one that was at, so uncontroversial. Look at, <laughs> look at Pennsylvania, for example, where, and I think you had a similar experience here. Look at Pennsylvania where uh, the, the law said, you know, ab, uh, mail-in ballots have to be delivered by, they have to be postmarked by a certain date, and you can't count them if they come in too late. And it went to the state Supreme Court and they said, no, 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 the state constitution says we have to maximize the voting experience, so we'll count them if they come in by Friday. Well, if the state legislature, if the independent state legislature theory had been in place, the state court would have had no authority to do that. Um, and I guess, the, to me, the question is sort of like this. Clearly, what those two provisions and the, the language in the Constitution twice, but in, in terms of uh, representatives and senators, this time, place, and manner shall be determined by, of elections for the states shall be determined by the legislature thereof, to me means the legislature sets the rules. And then the state court is the empire to see if the rules are followed or not. And if, these, if, this, if the Constitution is abided by. Um, this independent legislature theory seemed to have just three takers today. It was argued, the case was argued today, and it would appear that Justices Thomas, Alito, and Gorsuch, who have said before that they think this is the right way to go, seem to be the only ones fully embracing it. It was quite clear that Justice Sotomayor, Justice Kagan, and Justice Jackson, the three liberals, had no time for it at all. And so the controlling votes will be Roberts, Kavanaugh, and uh, Amy Coney Barrett, who all seem to have reservations about the theory. Um, so the question is, will they simply reject it whole hog, or will they say, for pe peculiar reasons, we think the Republicans were right here, and the state court was wrong, in other words, rule for the Republicans without embracing the theory. Uh, I think it's going to be either a rejection of this theory entirely or, uh, I guess, I, th I don't think they're going to go for the theory. It didn't seem, it didn't seem to have many enough takers. It, it, was a, it was a bold part But of you're right. It's a huge case. Um, and, you know, uh, it's complicated, but I think it, it has gotten a lot of attention. I, I know the Times has written about it. The Post has. Um, I did stories about it before I left, so I think it's a big deal. It, it certainly is a big case. I mean, I, it, the uh, Republicans in the legislature were quite, were quite clear in what they were doing. I think the line was, um, we, we, draw a ten, we drew a 10-3 map, 10 Republican to 3 Democrat map, because yeah. we couldn't figure out how to do an 11 to 2. Right. <laughs> That's a pretty bold, <laughs> yes. bold uh, they were They were there. quite candid about it. So I want to turn to a case that I know was difficult for NBC News and for you personally, and that's the case of Richard Jewell, who um, was considered a suspect in the Olympic Park bombing, ultimately a completely different person with a completely different agenda. Um, and I, I, I bring this case up not to poke the bear, but um, to say it, it, it hits on a really important aspect of journalism ethics, and that's our reliance on sources. So could you give us a brief on what happened with that situation, what you learned from it, um, and kind of the ethics of interacting and relying on sources? Well, as I recall, uh, what happened was Richard Jewell was a security guard at Olympic Park, and he was nearby when the bomb went off. Remember that there was a phone call that came in that said there's a bomb in Centennial Park, you have 15 minutes or whatever. And this was? Uh, At the year? Olympics. But which year was that? 96? Uh, yeah. I think that's right. Thank you, I'm glad you're here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let us know if we screw anything else up, okay? Uh, now, some uh, of these people are so young, not only were they not born, but their parents may not have been dating at the time, so. <laughs> uh, so, um, Richard Jewell be, it very quickly became, as you say, a suspect. And I think, I haven't thought about this case in years, but I think what happened was during some special coverage, I think it was Tom Brokaw who was anchoring, said that Jewell was a suspect or something. And he sued for libel and prevailed against NBC. Um, the fact is, you know, Richard Jewell was a suspect. Uh, he hadn't been charged with the crime, 
but there were many people in law enforcement who thought he did it. Uh, a parallel case would be the case of a guy named Stephen Hatfield, mm -hmm. who uh, after, the, after the anthrax, th there was a, a series in the same year that the uh, terrorist bombings happened, later in the year, all of a sudden there were these m letters that were sent through the mail that contained anthrax. And they were sent to uh, Tom Daschle, a senator, uh, Pat Leahy, a senator, Tom Brokaw, um, and others. And, you know, there was a huge hunt to figure out who was sending these letters because they were, they were you know, anthrax can be a deadly disease. It can cause serious uh, skin problems, and it can be deadly if you inhale it. Inhalation anthrax is a very serious disease. It can kill you. Uh, so uh, the FBI s began strongly to suspect a guy named Stephen Hatfield, who had worked at the Army uh, um, Research Lab and who had been quite outspoken and had exhibited a number of very bizarre behaviors. And the FBI was following him around. I mean, it was no secret that he was, that many, that many in the law enforcement thought was him. When you talk to people in law enforcement, they, you quickly found out that there was sort of two schools of thought. Yes, it is, and no, it isn't. But, you know, and finally it turned out to be a guy named Bruce Ivins who uh, committed suicide um, when the FBI was going to arrest him. And so the, the, that's the best idea. That's what the FBI concluded, is that it was him. But look, you, covering the Supreme Court is not a source beat. <laughs> uh, everyone who covers the court is on equal footing. We see the cases percolate in the lower courts. We see the lower courts decide them. We see the briefs submitted to the Supreme Court. We see the oral argument. We see the decisions. Boom. It's right out in front of everybody. Covering law enforcement is a source beat. And yes, you have to depend upon your sources. Uh, you can't cover law enforcement without depending on sources. Um, and so all the stories that you see on the front page of the New York Times or the Washington Post about the Mar-a-Lago investigation, all that stuff is coming from sources. Um, you know, when someone shoots up a school or blows up a shopping mall, uh, and I'm called upon to sit in front of the camera at MSNBC, I could say, uh, there's been an attack. I'll get back to you in four or five days when we know what happened. I don't have that option. Uh, and the audience wants to know. Um, and ever since 9-11, we are a jumpy country. And so when weird things happen, people want to know what's going on. And it's our obligation to try to find that out. And we can't simply wait for the official announcement. So we rely on our sources. And, you know, the, the checks that we go through internally to not screw up <laughs> are, pretty, are pretty extensive. Um, even when, they're in the, when we're in the heat of the moment. But you can't do that reporting without sources. Do you think we need to be more skeptical about um, deferring to official sources, authorities. I mean, you're, you're right. Law enforcement thought Jewel was a suspect, but he didn't do it. Uh, so it's true that they thought he was a suspect, but maybe he should not have been. Um, you know, the official statement from the Minneapolis police when George Floyd was murdered was that he, quote, died in a medical incident. Um, the law enforcement picture of um, the mass shooting in Uvalde was what they, the picture they were painting is very different from the reality. It, do journalists need to spend less time with officials and authorities and, and more time rounding out their sources in other ways? Well, I think of Uvalde is actually a very good case in point of how the official version fell apart before the paint was even dry on it. Um, if you're covering an investigation of a crime, um, your information comes from the people investigating the crime largely. And it's not like you can call the other police department and ask them how they're doing, or the other state police department, or the other FBI. Um, 
So you're kind of stuck with the people who are reviewing the case. Now, uh, you know, these things have changed crime reporting completely because if it weren't for a video of the George Floyd attack or a lot of these other videos that have come out about police encounters, it would be a very different thing. That's true. But um, for the most part, you know, when, when, when somebody shoots up the Navy Yard uh, and the FBI is investigating, you know, you're kind of stuck with official sources because they're the ones doing the investigating. And I would also say that, you know, you've, you've picked out some good examples of sort of object lessons about being careful, but they stand out by, I, I would say they're exceptional. They're not the rule. So before I turn to the um, audience questions, so get your brains working, um, <laughs> I, I want to ask, I want to circle back to the Supreme Court, and I want to ask, what, if anything, do you think is the fallout from the decision leak in Dobbs? What's, what, what's going to be long-lasting there, other than it happened, it shocked everybody, and then the outcome of the case didn't, didn't differ at all, nothing changed? Well, it's tremendously corrosive. It's hard to overstate the devastating effect that had in the court because the court largely exists uh, based on trust. The trust of the justices with their clerks, the clerks with each other, the justices with each other. And that leak just cast an enormous cloud over that. They were, they were you know, everybody was suspicious of everybody else. So it's it's been t tremendously damaging. I, I would be shocked if we ever find out who the leaker was. I always thought the best chance to find out would be the leaker would come forward and say, hey, I leaked this so you all would know what was coming. I did it for you. I'm a hero. And I thought that's what was going to happen, but it didn't, and I doubt that it will. I don't know. Maybe somebody someday will write a book about it. I do know, having been on both sides of the issue in the government and in the news media, the investigations with the lowest batting average are <laughs> leak investigations. They almost never go anywhere. Uh, so I'd be shocked if the Supreme Court ever figures this out. You know, they, the, the Chief Justice assigned this duty to the marshal who has many functions. Criminal investigation <laughs> is not one of them. And I would just be shocked if the court ever figures this out. I, I assume the leaker was smart enough not to use the Supreme Court's fax machine or a Supreme Court telephone uh, to carry out this leak to Politico. Um, I was in one of the classes here, and I raised this question. I'll ask you an ethical question. Suppose you were a reporter, and... Um, somebody came to you with a draft of a Supreme Court decision and said, here, would you do this story? No. <laughs> you wouldn't? In this case, I don't think I would have Well, I had this story. discussion. I had this and, discussion. But someone else would have. Well, so, I mean, look, whatever our feelings would be, I mean, I wondered this myself. If somebody had come to me instead of Josh Gerstein from Politico or whoever it was at Politico that they went to, it wouldn't have been my decision. I would have had to talk to my higher ups, and they would have said, "What are you nuts? If they don't, if we don't do it, somebody else will. They'll just go down the street to ABC, assuming they're still on the air, um, and <laughs> no or no CNN, there. or CNN, or or somebody else." Um, so I think I don't think I would have whatever whatever pure objections I might have had. I think would have <laughs> yielded to competitive pressures. And I, and I think, honestly, competitive pressures are one of the most difficult things about journalism ethics because it drives a lot of bad decision-making, a lot of fast decision-making and a lot of bad decision-making. Um, you know, for me, I, I agree with you. Uh, it would have driven a lot of traffic to anyone's site. It would have gotten a lot of people watching uh, nightly news. Sure. Uh, that's not a, that's not a, a reason <coughs> to do it. So um, do you think there will be more? Or you think that uh, the cloud the cloud cast is that this is we're really not going to see another leak like that? I well, I wouldn't have guessed this would have happened, so I'm the wrong guy to ask. <laughs> um, but since you have asked the wrong guy, I'll answer it. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I'd be surprised. Uh, look, this was a this was a case involving an issue that had been a a, a, a matter of public debate for 50 years. 
There was an annual march in Washington every year after Roe to object to it. Uh, this was a constitutional right that was enjoyed by uh, more than half the women in America uh, had, you know, yielded, had, uh, had sought these sorts of services. Um, so it was huge. It was huge in that sense. And it had been simmering forever. So I just think it's in a class by itself. And maybe that does I don't, change. I can't imagine somebody, you know, whipping the public frenzy up by leaking the decision in the independent legislature theory case. <laughs> well, the case that you all should care about, but nobody is <laughs> talking to you about. Uh, I mean, it, you know, the decision to, to do the reporting on the leak, I shouldn't have been so cavalier with saying I wouldn't run it. Uh, it there, I, I still ask questions and don't have answers about how that material was vetted whether they knew that it was real. It sure looked real, but you know, in the age of mis and disinformation and deep fakes, uh, I still have questions about the verification of the document itself. So I should be careful about why, what my, what my concerns were with how, with how and when it well, came Well, I mean, I, look, I know Josh f from Politico. I think, I think they carefully, I, I don't know who the source was. I think they were satisfied that it was the real thing. You just had to look at it to realize it was the real thing. It didn't take long to know. And here's the surprising thing. The, I called the court the next day to say, you know, are you going to, well, I actually called him that night, but then the next day I called again to say, <clears throat> you know, are you going to say anything about this, about the leak? Are you going to criticize it? Because if you criticize it, you're confirming that it's the real thing. Well, <laughs> not only did they criticize it, they immediately announced that they were investigating it. So the court uh, confirmed that it was the real thing within 12 hours after the leak. All right, let me open it up to you guys. This has been fascinating so far. What else do you have? I think we've got someone right here. And then. <coughs> and again, if you're joining us online, feel, three, feel free to throw a question into the chat and our fellows will be glad to ask it for you. So start out right over here, please. Hi, um, really excited to be here today. I was in your class a couple of years ago when it was online, so nice to finally see you in person. Yeah. Um, but I have a question about um, uh, neutrality. How ethical do you think it is to give equal weight to both sides when it might be clear that um, one side is factually inaccurate or just making outright false claims that you are able to verify or discredit? Well, uh, so two different things. When you're talking about a Supreme Court case, um, I, you, you have to be neutral. You can't pick winners and losers. And that's generally true in the law, especially in criminal cases, uh, where you know nobody's convicted until the jury says so. So you have to be very careful. Um, I, think, I, think this, I think this question you raised has under, is kind of answering itself because you saw this a lot in the terms of the change of how news organizations handled statements by the former president. Yeah. Because I think early on, uh, they said, well, he's the president, this is what he said, here you go. And then as time went on, news organizations would more and more say, he made this statement and that's wrong. Um, and I, you know, I think that that's the right thing to do. If it's clearly wrong, why let anybody make a statement that you know is wrong? Why just simply report it if it's wrong? And you did see that, um, you know, in the legal cases arising from election denial, the, you know, 60-odd cases that uh, former President Trump lost in, in jurisdiction after jurisdiction after jurisdiction. You did see that in the reporting. I, I love the little, the little bit of trivia that connects the Richard Jewell tri- uh, libel case to uh, the the uh, Trump litigation. You want to share that with everybody? Huh. Well, it's a Richard sea change in a person. Richard Jewell's lawyer was an an Atlanta lawyer named Lynn Wood, who became one of the main. Um, well, let me quote Bill Barr. He was part of the clown posse uh, <laughs> advising President Trump. Um, so, truth is a defense in a libel action, Mr. Wood. I was quoting the former Attorney General Barr. Uh, so. <laughs> there we go. Okay, do we have another? Oh, right over here. 
Okay, I'm going to ask you a question which I think um, exemplifies uh, very seriously the question of journalism and ethics. That would be uh, the situation of Julian Assange, where you have the question of the public's right to know versus the government's insistence on uh, maintaining a strong uh, system of uh, information uh, security. And then closely tied into that, since you mentioned the topic, I'm also concerned about the revolving door system of persons going uh, from government into industry and back, particularly in the case of persons who have security clearances because that uh, expedites the possibility that they can just go uh, in indefinitely from a job requiring a clearance in government to one that requires a clearance in the private sector and back and forth, so thus creating an artificial job market. So be interested in your points of view on those questions. Thank you. <coughs> so I'll answer them in reverse order. Um, there's no doubt that the government has become so dependent upon private contractors. Uh, certainly the, the Defense Department is probably more than any other. <clears throat> I don't think now the government could work if it didn't have people that had security clearances and could go from private industry designing weapon systems and then coming back into the government. Whether that's a good thing or not, I take your point. Uh, the fact is, I think we're in a position now where if we stopped it, it would be a disaster. Um, the first part of the... I'm, refresh my memory on the first part of the question. Assange, Julian Assange. Oh, Julian Assange, yeah. So, uh, you know, that's a tough one because um, the... You know, there is a criminal case against him. Um, and it's interesting that I don't think this has been a partisan thing because I think the Republicans and Democrats, whether they were running the Justice Department, have gone back and forth about whether to charge Assange with a crime. The problem is this, as I understand it. Um, if, if I am in possession of a government secret and I come to you at the Milwaukee Journal and I give it to you, I have violated the law because I sign a confidentiality agreement when I get a security clearance. I can't give classified information to someone who is not cleared to have it. I give it to you and you publish it. Um, there's no clear law that says you have violated the law by publishing it. However, if you ask me, hey Pete, go to the Defense Department and you know break into one of those safes and get me that classified stuff, then you're in a different position. You have, you're egging me on to violate the law. And, and that's the government's theory about Assange, is that he was egging on, um, especially uh, um, the army private, uh, to get classified information. And that's the nature of the government's case, as I understand it. Interesting. So... Uh, I'm the reporter. You can give it to me. Could we both store them in a golf club in Florida? <laughs> <laughs> well, questions? do we have any from our online? All you have to do is think about them not being classified. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then dismantle the Constitution, <laughs> suspend the Constitution. Uh, do we have a question from our online audience? Yes, this question is, do you consider the motive of a source as is the leaked Dobbs decision when deciding to run a story, and how do you verify a source? Well, you know, that's, I think that's a very good question. I've, and, and I talked about this in one of the classes I was here at. I wonder, you know, ordinarily when a reporter gets a leaked information, they don't say in the story what the motive of the leaker was. Um, I wonder if in this story there would have been some merit in that. And I, and I think if you look at Josh's story in Politico, they sort of tippy-toe up to that and don't quite go there. But I think, I think there might have been some merit to that. Um, you know, it may or may not be relevant to a story. I don't think every leak is 
the motive of the leaker is, is terribly relevant. Sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. Look, government officials leak things for many reasons. Uh, there's a policy under consideration that they think is stupid and they think if it gets leaked and becomes public, it will die. So they leak it. Or they think their boss is brilliant and they want you to know things that their boss has done. Um, or they just want to help you do a story. They just want to see you get it right. And so they'll help, they'll leak you stuff. Um, I, I, I think, I think there, maybe in this case it would have been a little more relevant. In terms of uh, verifying that it really was the draft decision, um, Politico seems to have satisfied itself and they were right. Can I ask a follow-up to that? Um, are you concerned at all with the use of confidential sources when those are people in positions of power? Are we too loose in granting confidentiality? So let's just let's just have a flight of fancy and let's say the leaker was Alito and he was trying to pressure Kavanaugh into staying on the team and not moving over to the Roberts position, which would have changed the that you know would not have overturned. I will bet you money. It oh was no, not I'm Alito. not saying it was it was Alito. <laughs> But let's say it was actually not a clerk. It, it was a justice. Should that person be able to hide behind um, that confidentiality? No. No. I don't think so in that so, case, no. So if it was Sam Alito, you would have outed him, taken the, taken the opinion and said, I got this from the justice? Well, um, I think y y you always negotiate with a source about what the terms are. Um, so... <laughs> I'm reminded of when I worked at DOD, I told a reporter something and they said that the information came from someone who spoke authoritatively for the secretary. And I thought, okay, well that doesn't exactly give me much to hide behind. <laughs> um, but generally speaking, when you give people information or people give you information, and you, you, know, you, you, you negotiate the terms. So what are you gonna be? Are you a senior law enforcement official? Are you a federal law enforcement official? Are you a senior administration? You know, we, we go back and forth over what it is. And I suspect that would be the same. I think if a an un highly unlikely situation in which a Supreme Court justice wants to leak something, uh, they wouldn't give it to you unless you agreed not to reveal who it is. And then you have a, a difficult decision to make. And, well, and you have a Supreme Court precedent that, uh, that says you could be in deep trouble if you violate that off-the-record agreement. You know, you've got the Cohen versus Coles media case. You could yeah, be, well, you that's right. Yeah. That's right. Do we have another? Oh, one way up there. Hi. Um, so as you know, the government is to provide liberty under law which means that no law should be passed unless, it, unless it's designed to protect the people's freedom and liberty. So that being said, how have you felt about the recent laws being overturned this year, and what can you still do within your power to raise awareness about these topics? Um, well, I'm not sure that, look, there, uh, I'm not sure that every law is intended to protect the people's liberty. Um, I don't, I mean, it, I suppose in a very generalized way that's true, um, but um, I, I, and, and I can easily answer the question in terms of what my own power is. My own power right now is zero. Um, I do think though that, you, you know, the, the essence of your question is a good one because I think when Congress especially is so beholden to special interests that it forgets the public interest, that's a legitimate thing for news organizations to report. <clears throat> and I think people who cover Congress are very sensitive to that and are looking out for that. And the same is true of the city council or the county commissioners. You know, is, are, they, are they making decisions about a development <clears throat> because they think it's really good for the city or because the contractor is a pal? So that's, you know, that's always an issue for journalists. And um, I'm, I, I'm not sure that every law that's passed is intended, you know, I don't know quite where that formulation comes from, but I think you're on to something and I think it's always a legitimate subject for, ju for journalists to inquire into. Well, it could be that the 
other two, the co-equal branches, the executive and the, and the legislative, are constantly trying to write laws that constrain <laughs> liberty, and the courts are, are there to, um, to protect it. It's certainly, it's an interesting way that you framed it. So uh, any last question? I think we have time for one more. Um, Audrey, right up there, if we could. <laughs> I've got my tall. I like the there. way you we could pick out the people up. in the back row. If it's yeah. <laughs> Poor, uh, sorry, poor Audrey. <laughs> run, run, run. Yes. <laughs> he needs much longer arms. Um, first off, I want to say congrats on an amazing career. Thank you. Um, and also, um, looking back on your time with NBC, obviously you covered a lot, but is there anything, that, like any stories, any topics that stick out to you as especially memorable? Um, well, sure. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, I was sitting in my, at my desk one Labor Day, which is not a busy news day, <laughs> and I got a tip that an FBI agent had been arrested and charged, uh, accused of spying for the Russians. And I thought, well, that is interesting. And strangely enough, it just, all the stars aligned. Uh, it's hard to find people on a holiday. But I managed to get the story confirmed. And I told Nightly News about it, and they were thrilled to have some actual news to report on Labor Day. But I still hadn't gotten to the FBI. I had found lots of people around it who knew about it, but not the Bureau itself. And I finally reached an assistant director. It was 6 o'clock. Nightly News comes on at 6.30. And I said, I don't have time to ask you. It was so cold I could barely turn the pages of the decision. My fingers were so numb. It seemed hard to figure out at the time. I have reread that decision many times and it seems so obvious, but at the time it seemed complicated. But Bush wrote in his book that he thinks he's the first president to figure out he was elected by watching television. Um, so that was, that was pretty exciting. Um, you know, and there have been some uh, historic Supreme Court decisions that were... Uh, that were amazing to report. I mean, you know, it is, it's a great beat because think about this. All throughout our history, until 2008, the Supreme Court never said what the Second Amendment means. Is it a personal right or is it a militia right? They didn't answer.
of them. <laughs> um, but uh, no, I, I don't think so. I mean, I, I said I talked about this in one of the classes. Um, I had gotten a tip that a guy who was a incendiary right wing racist white supremacist short wave radio internet radio host was actually an FBI informant. And I thought, well, that's kind of a good story. So I worked the story up. I had little excerpts from his broadcast. I talked to some experts about why the FBI would want people like that. And then I finally called him up. I said, hey, um, I'm not going to say his name here, but... Um, it wasn't Alex Jones. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I said, I understand you're an FBI informant. And he said, oh, God, please don't do that story. I said, why not? He said, you have to understand the people I hang out with. If they find out an, I'm an FBI informant, I'm a dead man. They will kill me. I said, oh, come on. He said, no, I'm serious. He said, these are bad dudes, and I will be killed if you do that story. I didn't do the story. Uh, you know, I thought to myself, okay, <laughs> what I would basically say is, good evening, here's a guy you never heard of, and guess what he's doing? I mean, is it worth jeopardizing someone's life for that? And I thought, no. Now there is a coda to this story. Years later, <laughs> he was accused of soliciting the murder of a federal judge which didn't happen. I mean, the, the, the murder didn't, the solicitation did. <laughs> and he called me up and said, would you please testify that I was an FBI informant? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no. <laughs> and we got the subpoena quashed. But, you know, those are the sorts of decisions that, as you know, uh, Madam Spider, um, journalists make all the time. Uh, you know, those of us who cover or covered, people who cover law enforcement oftentimes come into possession of information that we don't report. Uh, we find out that someone is, un, you know, that there is an arrest warrant out for them and they're on the hunt for them. It would be nuts to report that and alert them to the fact that they're, the government is trying to arrest them. So we hold off on that stuff. Uh, we're, you know, we find out, we figure out that there's going to be a a search warrant served, or as they always say in journalism, a raid uh, <laughs> on some business or political figure. The next morning, well, we don't report that. We have our cameras there ready to report it. I mean, ready to record it, but we don't report that. So, you know, we're often in position. We, we, we try to be pretty responsible, is what I'm trying to say. Um, and I will just tell you that I was on the opposite end of this sort of interaction as well. In some of my final days at the Pentagon, the U.S. was preparing to carry out a cruise missile attack on a sensitive Iraqi military facility. And I was in my office waiting for this to happen with the lights off. Now, it was a Sunday, I think, and so I didn't expect many reporters to be in the building. I mean, one of the great things about the Defense Department is, and I, as far as I know, there are only two defense ministries in the world where this is true, the U.S., and South Korea, where the reporters are in the same building as the military establishment. It's not true in the London, it's not true in Paris, it's not true in Tokyo. <laughs> um, but our reporters hang out just down the hall from where my office was. So I was kind of hiding out. <laughs> Knock on the door, it's, it's David Martin from CBS. He says, uh, I understand we're going to have a cruise missile attack uh, on Iran, or on Iraq, and uh, we're going to report that pretty soon. And I said, geez, I, I wish you wouldn't do that. He said, why? I mean, there are no, this isn't a, these aren't pilots. There's no lives at stake here, so what's the deal? And I said, well, look, Iraq's um, air defenses are not very good, but if we tell them we're coming, it would improve the accuracy of their, and they, they would blunt to some extent, the attack. And these things are expensive. So he said, I said, look, let's make a deal. 
if you'll hold off until the first missile hits, by which time the Iraqis will have figured out what's up, then I will tell you, I'll give you the serial number of every missile, I'll tell you how to pronounce the name in Iraq, you'll be a genius. He said, okay. And then I had to go ask the Secretary of Defense if this deal I had just got was all right, and he said yes. So, you know, it works both ways. It is, it's interesting. I, I often share with people that um, some of the most important ethical decisions made in journalism are things that you never see. It's deciding what not to run, what, yeah, not, true. To, what not to put out there. So, well, thank you so much for coming into my little web I, <laughs> and for doing it. You know, they say the best ones play hurt. Um, you know, <laughs> we've had this nasty cold. If this is how you golf with a broken leg, you're on the PGA Tour when you're back to, uh, to health. So thank <laughs> you so much. My pleasure. And thank you to all of you for joining us. I hope that you will uh, stay invested in the Center for Journalism Ethics. And speaking of the great ones playing hurt, a shout out online to our administrator, Krista Eastman, who is knocked down by the flu, but still in the background helping us keep everything running. So have a great night, everybody, and thanks for being with us.